Hey, hey, glad to see you here again. <laughs> I guess Thanks. from the previous discussion, there are a lot of questions in the Telegram chat. Uh, so <laughs> hope hope you will have uh, some time to uh, answer them. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't want to waste uh, your time here. Uh, let's let's get into the details. Okay. Are, are, are you ready for the talk? Vladimir, Good I think, time. yeah, I think we're ready, right? Not more introduction, but of course you need some banjo. This is awesome. This is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and right now we are ready for the talk. <laughs> okay. Super. Super. Well, thank you so much for uh, for the for the introduction, for the invitation to come and speak. Uh, I don't have prepared slides. I'll be sh uh, drawing stuff as we go along. Um, and thank you so much to uh, ETB Bank for sponsoring uh, uh, my uh, appearance here. I appreciate their support. Uh, what I wanted to talk with you about today is a feature of testing that doesn't get enough uh, enough attention. So, and this is TCR, we were talking about the details of what do you type and then you type this or do you type that. It is very specific. I'm going to zoom way out and say, well, what is... What is the role of testing in software development? Why do we even do this? And um, so, uh, we there's a we're always faced with bigger and bigger problems. As soon as a software development can solve a problem at a certain scale, we're asked to solve it at the next larger scale, and the next larger, and the next larger. And you can see this in the history of computing, where it used to be Lots of programmers worried a lot about the efficiency of sorting. We can't even imagine that today because it's just a solved problem. Well, once that's a solved problem, then we have to think about bigger things. So there's this constant uh, push to solve bigger and bigger big problems. And the problem with that is we're humans, you know, and I hate that. I wish it wasn't true, but there you go. You know, the biggest joke the universe ever played on me was when I was a little kid, I didn't understand people at all, but I was fascinated with machines. I loved uh, all kinds of different machines. And the, the universe promised me when I was introduced to programming about 11, that uh, if you just understand this machine perfectly, then that's it. You don't have to deal with people. So I got obsessed with the machine and I got better and better at working with the machine and knowing more about what was going on inside of it and having a more and more accurate model of, of uh, the, the whole context of computing. And ah, I thought this is fantastic. And then the universe said, ha ha, just kidding. Uh, if you want to create value in the world, you have to be able to deal with human beings. <sighs> and I just spent 15 years of my life ignoring human beings because I was promised I didn't have to deal with humans. So I've never really gotten over the, the, uh, the, my anger and sh shame about this. But uh, one thing I did learn is a, a bunch of techniques for uh, dealing with the fact that I'm a human and other people are humans and we have emotions and physical bodies and we're illogical at times. So whenever I look at a, a basic problem like this, okay, we've got tests and we would like them to be more valuable. What's going to make them more valuable? Well, Let's look at the human needs involved. So there's this continual imperative 
to solve bigger and bigger problems. But as soon as I try to solve a bigger problem, I have anxiety. Oh, I've never done this before. I don't know if I can do this. And uh, now, uh, as soon as I get anxious, then I uh, my brain function goes down. Ugh. So more anxiety means less brain function. And the less brain function, the smaller the problem I can handle. So we call this a, a inhibiting loop, which means the bigger the problems I try and solve, the more anxiety I have, the, the less capable I am, I am of solving big problems and the smaller the problems that I get. So this, this loop limits the size of the problems that I can solve as a programmer. If I try and stretch bigger than I possibly can, then the universe is going to say, mm, no, 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 no. We're going to go back and solve smaller problems again. And especially if there's a mismatch, if I have to solve a big problem and I'm only capable of solving a small problem, lots of teams have been in this state and it's, it's no fun. So how do we get out of this? What is, and here's the, the role of testing. What if my reaction to anxiety was not to just get nervous? What if when I got anxious, I uh, wrote more tests? Now that, that means I have to decide to write more tests. And someone's gonna, from the outside, is gonna be saying, no, solve a bigger problem, solve a bigger problem, solve a bigger problem. And I have to have the, the courage, the presence to say, I will, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm gonna write more tests. Because the more tests I write, the less anxiety I have. And this is another inhibiting loop, which says the more anxious I am, if I learn this habit of writing tests, the more anxious I am, the more tests I write, the less anxious I am. Oh, so this rising anxiety that leads to me having to solve smaller and smaller problems gets reversed if I introduce tests to my programming workflow. And now, as the problems get bigger, the anxiety goes up, the tests go up, the anxiety goes down, my brain function improves, and I'm more capable of, of solving bigger problems than I was without it. T Nobody's paying for tests. That's one of the contradictions of tests, is that nobody wants tests. My, my customers want a button that sums up the thing and compares it with the other thing and highlights and that's what they want. They don't want tests to prove that that works that way. And so they're not going to ask for them. Sometimes they are even going to demand that I not write tests. I remember the first time I worked on Wall Street, I went and bought a brand new three piece navy blue suit. Oh, I was looking good. I didn't realize that on Wall Street, everybody knows how much every suit costs. And anyway, I walked in there and I was feeling good. I explained to the bond trader, well, here's how I work. And I write these tests and I refactor and I document and da, da, da. And he said, and I said, okay. And so I can give you this, uh, this uh, spreadsheet engine. I was going to write a spreadsheet engine, special purpose spreadsheet engine. And uh, I said, uh, and I can do that in six weeks. And he says, uh, how fast can you do it if you don't write those tests? And I thought, oh, man, I, I, I don't feel at home now. This is, this is uncomfortable. And it's because there's a, 
there's an, an, uh, a temptation to take the people out of the picture. If I say, how long will it take? The more tests I write, the longer it will take. Therefore, I'll write less tests and we're done. Well, if, if we were talking about machines, yeah, that would be true. But we're not. We're talking about people and they have emotions. And I wanted to feel pride in my work. I wanted the programmers who came after me to be able to change the code that I wrote. And so I needed to write tests, even if he didn't need me to write tests. And that was a that was a big wake up call, though. I needed from my perspective, writing tests was a good thing. From his perspective, writing tests was a bad thing. So he, that's. We write tests because we need to, even though that's not the primary product that anybody is, is paying for. So that's how I think about uh, the role of testing in general. Okay, so let's say you agree and you say, yeah, we want to have tests. Um, we're all humans. We have human needs. The tests meet human needs. Uh, and overall, we'll get more done if we have tests. So uh, now, uh, what if, what, what, what happens then? Okay, so this is a, I, I, since this is a testing conference, or the conference is focused on Heisenberg, sounded like something that involved testing, I'm hoping. If not, well, this may be interesting anyway, so we'll see. Let's say we've accepted the need for tests. And now, this is kind of where things are. Back when I was a little tiny programmer, um, pr programmers didn't write tests. That was, that was beneath us. You know, we were the elite. Testers were kind of second-class citizens. And one of the the changes that I helped bring about was that it became respectable for programmers to write tests again. So um, now testers were writing tests and programmers were writing tests and they, everybody's writing tests and they're feeling better and the anxiety gets flushed out. And but now you've got a lot of tests and the longer you write tests, the longer the tests take to run. And there's no natural stopping spot for how long the tests can take to run. Now, again, 40 years ago, you would have gigantic C++ programs that would take two days to compile. We can't really imagine that, but um, uh, that, that's how things works. So if you were going to make a change to a C++ program and you were going to have to wait two days to find out if it worked or not, that was kind of back to my early, early days when I punched programs on cards and you would carry a box of cards and you'd hand them in. And then several hours later, you'd get a stack of green and white striped paper and you'd be able to see the results. Well, that was actually a horrible programming experience because you couldn't afford to make any mistakes. But you kind of had to. And here's, here's that loop. Let me, let me get to the, the meat of what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, the big problem here is a delay in feedback. I make a decision. How long does it take me to find out if that decision has the consequences I wanted to? Here's an if statement, and I say, oh, that's wrong. I need to, it needs to be less than or greater instead of greater than for whatever reason. Am I right? Maybe and maybe not. How long does it take me to find out? So, um, the, and here we're, we're talking at a very abstract level. I could be talking about really, I'm a programmer. I just edited my code to say greater than instead of less than, to, you know, do the test pass. Now, does it do what the 
customer wants it to do? Now, does it have the effect on the business that I want it to have? All those are feedback loops and they're all subject to a, a certain amount of delay. So we're, we're, I'm, I'm talking about the testing feedback loop, but it, it's applicable also at other levels. So the more delay there is, the more impatient I get. So these are uh, system diagrams, if you haven't seen them before. And um, I, with uh, Jessica Kerr, I give a, a workshop called Introduction to Systems Thinking. Um, and this is a this is a great book to get started if you want more of this. It turns out there's a a whole discipline of thinking in terms of systems this way. But um, maybe Vladimir can post a link to that. Um, okay, so there's a delay. I've changed my code, and now I'm waiting for the tests. One of the nice things about having a beard is you have something to scratch when you're feeling impatient. So highly recommended to people who are able to grow beards. Um, and, and you thought this was going to be a programming talk. It turns out it's about personal grooming, too. So you're welcome. So what do I do when I'm impatient? Well, uh, let's say that I'm working in a pull request code review environment, and I have lots and lots to say about code review, and I'm not going to say hardly any of it today. But anyway, let's say we're working in that kind of environment. So I've, I've written some code. I've submitted a pull request. Now I'm waiting for the review to come back. What am I gonna do? Well, I have work to do. I need to get more done. So uh, I might start speculating. Speculation. I might start speculating about what I want to do next. So I stack another diff on top of the diff that I've just finished. Except now the, the code review comes back with comments. So I have to change my original diff. And then I have to rebase the other diff that I stacked on top of it. But that means there's even more delay in getting feedback. So now I have two diffs stacked up. And then I'm, I'm waiting for the the final acceptance of the first diff. So I start a third diff on top of the first two, and then I get comments for the first diff, and then I have to rebase both. And then that takes me even more time. Now the delays are getting longer, and so now I'm more impatient. So this is called a positive or reinforcing loop here. Actually, to me, I'm going to do that in a different color, just... So this is a reinforcing loop, which means the more delay there is, the more delay there is. If I, if I follow this around and around and around, or the more impatient I am, the more I speculate, the more I rebase, the more I delay, the more impatient I am. So that's a reinforcing loop and I get stuck in it. Okay, so that's one response to delay. Uh, another response to delay is that Maybe I'm not going to work on top of the same diff that I'm waiting for. I'm going to start something else completely different. So I'm going to work, oops, wrong color. I'm going to work in parallel. I'm going to switch content. I'm impatient. So I'm going to work on something else that also needs to get done. And uh, now I'm, I have to, now I have context switching. The more I work in parallel, the more context switching I have. And the more context switching I have, the more delay in getting feedback, which leads me more impatient. Ugh. So that's another reinforcing loop. And I have one more. 
uh, if I'm impatient, now this this was really common 30 years ago. If it's going to take me two days to to uh, recompile my whole system, I'm not going to change one line and then recompile it. I'm not going to work for one minute and then have 48 hours to wait. I mean, this is a it's a trade off space. And right now it's tilted this way. The cost for feedback is very high. So if that's true, then I want to work in big batches. So I'm going to go off and I'm going to, I'm going to work for two weeks. And then I'm going to integrate stuff. Except if I do that, there's more mistakes. And the mistakes cause more delay. And now we have another reinforcing loop. So the th this whole dysfunctional system is all centered on the delay in getting feedback. So when extreme programming what came out, the subtitle of the book is Embrace Change. Don't try to predict exactly what's going to happen. Expect that things are going to change. How would you work if you expected things to change instead of expecting them to stay the same? And again, all of this uh, hinges on the delay in getting feedback from decisions. So, uh, general observation about systems. Uh, if any time you, you have a reinforcing loop, you can always drive it both ways. So uh, when I consult with companies, one of the most exciting moments is when I understand why things are so screwed up. Because they say, you know, they're, they're running one of these loops. Oh, we have to get more work done. And because we have to get more work done, we're working in bigger and bigger batches. That leads to more mistakes, which leads to more delays, which leads to more impatience. As soon as I see that loop, I think, oh, hallelujah, we can fix this. Because every reinforcing loop can be driven both ways. Here, in, the, in this original reinforcing loop, what we have is... Uh, there's more and more impatience being injected from the outside world. Oh, you're going too slow. And so you accidentally do things that make you slower. And that creates more impatience and so on. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can, we can reach inside this system, anywhere inside this system, and and uh, intervene and, and make things different. Now, you might think, oh, well, the first thing we'll do is we're just going to uh, uh, force batch sizes to be smaller. So no diffs above 40 lines, 12 lines, 4,000 lines, whatever. That doesn't really solve the problem, though, because we haven't addressed uh, what's what upstream of the batch sizes. There's a reason anytime people are doing something that makes no sense, to me, this is a hard one lesson. Anytime people are doing something that makes no sense to me, it makes perfect sense to them. So if I see people and they're not writing tests and they could be, well, there's a reason they're not writing tests. If I wag my finger and say, if you, were a, if you were a responsible programmer, if you were an adult programmer, if you were a, a true professional, then you would write tests. It's not that people don't want to write tests. It's that writing tests makes no sense in their system. And we're all embedded in all of these systems at all different scales. So now as a older and perhaps wiser person, 
I start thinking about, okay, well, why does it not make sense for you to write tests? Or why does it make sense for the tests to take 50, uh, 15 minutes or an hour to run? We have this delay. It's causing problems. But, but why is it that things have gotten to where they are? So what I can do now, if I see this whole, this reinforcing loop, is I can make the delay shorter. And here's where the earlier question about uh, ROI of a particular practice doesn't make sense to me. It assumes linear effects. If I make a small change to programming practice, I'll have a small change to the team's output. And that's just not true. And it's not true because we're embedded in these systems. If I make the, the delay, if I shorten the delay in getting feedback from tests, it's, it's not... You know, you, you, the linear way to look at that is, well, everyone is spending, uh, they run tests four times a day. And so I've got uh, four, tests a, four test runs a day times uh, 60 minutes equals uh, 20, 240 minutes. And uh, so, and that's times a pr programmer costs me, uh, uh, I don't know how much your programmers cost. So I'm just gonna give you $300 an hour. Uh, uh, divided by 60 is uh, $5 a minute times is, uh, earlier I said one of the things I like about speaking to Russian geeky audiences is that you know um, mathematics really well. I don't know how you are with arithmetic, but here we go. So we could, we could call this, uh, what is it? Right. Sorry? 1,200, I guess. 1, yeah, okay. So that's cool. I save $1,200 per person per day by reducing the delay. Nope. That, that's, that's the least of your savings. If you, can, if you can reduce the amount of impatience, and that leads you to not writing speculative work that you have to rebase, you save all of this rebasing money, too. You save all this context switching money, too. You save the cost of all these mistakes, too. So, yeah, it's $1,200, but it's not $1,200. Because you also, by reducing impatience, there's a bunch of other effects. Now I'm a nicer teammate. I don't, I don't yell at you. You don't punch me in the nose. I don't have to go to the hospital. It's effects on effects on effects. So you could say, well, how much is it worth? Is it worth $1,200 for me to reduce the delay? No, well, it's not the... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. You are placing the picture when we optimize all the tests and all the delay and all the patients goes away. But uh, in reality, we can, well, it's really hard to do that. It's probably impossible to do that. So what sure, we cuz we're in a trade-off space. Right the the cost of reducing uh test delay at first it's going to be easy, the cost is going to be low and it's going to be easy and as we as we get down to uh you know for for an hour to 10 minutes and 10 minutes to 1 minute and 1 minute to 10 seconds it's going to start getting expensive and then 10 seconds to one second and one second to 100 millisecond. Now it's going to get really expensive to improve that. Absolutely, the benefits, the the the, the cost of the of the delay, also decreases in this diminishing fashion. So what I'm saying is there's there's a place in this trade-off space, and right now I believe that people are are over here in the trade-off space. They're, they're willing to accept long delays for test runs 
and they don't realize that they things could already be better. So what I'm suggesting is that we deliberately move down this curve so that we're aware of the delay for test results as something that has first order effects, yes, but also has these kind of second order effects that I'm talking about. And that's what I'm that's what I'm not seeing today. I've been working on this program problem for probably 20 years. Now I realize that means that that sounds like a long time to uh to most of you. Uh and as somebody who uh, turned 60 this year, uh, 20 years is an eye blink. Um, it, especially if you're trying to change systems. And, and we had great examples of why those systems are hard to change. You know, well, what's the ROI? How do I get approval? Blah, 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 blah. Right. And, and all of that resistance to change is there for a reason. Right? It's the bank is making money. If nothing changes, the bank will continue to make money. So anybody suggesting changes is threatening the money-making machine that all we have to do is get on the bicycle and pedal and, and money is going to be floating out the back and somebody just has to grab it out of the air and that's all. But the problem is that's not all because the change is coming from the outside. And that's that's why extreme programming was subtitled Embrace Change. And it, I hadn't ever thought about it this way. Organizations are there to prevent change. And along comes Kent, you know, with my little extreme programming. And I say, okay, please, please, here is a way to encourage change. And the organizations looked at that and they said, no, we don't want to change. All we have to do is keep pedaling the money bicycle and dollar bills are going to spew out the back. So here I am. I have nice guitars. That part's good. So <sighs> let's see, where's I going? Okay. So I, this is uh, I, I, what I'm proposing is a change in the way that we evaluate and optimize testing tools. Uh, it was a big step forward when people started writing so many tests that it took a while to run them. That was progress. It was better than not having the tests. I don't know if you, you know, this whole uh, uh, crazy idea that you shouldn't release on a Friday. Never, never push to production on a Friday. That's terrible advice. Figure out why you don't want to push to production on Friday and fix it. And then push to production on Friday. I was at Facebook for seven years. And um, uh, we, the demand on Facebook is, is uh, cyclical during the day. And at that time, there were lots of college, when I joined, there were lots of college students using it. So about between uh, 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., there was a huge spike in usage. And then in the middle of the night, U.S. time, because it was a mostly U.S. based at that time, the demand was way, way lower. So it was tempting to go to production at these low points. And it was absolutely fatal. Because if you push to production when demand is low, something can easily be wrong and you don't find out until the middle of the next day. And in the meantime, 200, 2,000 other things have changed about the system. So the cost of debugging goes way, way up. So we push to production at peak. So if there were going to be problems, they were going to happen right then. We could revert, brings in the whole topic of reversibility, which is something else I could talk about for hours and hours. Uh, but you push to production on peak. S same goes with pushing the production on Friday. If you're afraid of pushing the production on Friday, find out why you're afraid 
and put the systems in place, the human systems in place, the training, the monitoring, the discipline, the whatever you have to do so that you're not afraid to push on Friday. Because if you're afraid to push on Friday and you don't, all of those problems are going to get worse. And then you don't want to push on Thursday. You can't push Thursday or Friday. And then the problems are going to get worse. And then you can't push Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And then you don't want to push on Tuesday either because, wow, that causes problems. And then nobody wants to push on Monday because nobody's had their coffee yet. And now you're absolutely hogtied. You can't move. So when you're in that system where more mistakes, I mean, I could, we could draw that system where you make mistakes, so you try less often, so you make more mistakes, so you try less often. That's the, that's the reinforcing loop there. But anytime you have a reinforcing loop, you can drive it the other direction. You can't stop making mistakes, but you can choose how often you try. So... Uh, that, that's, uh, that's what I'm, I'm suggesting. Okay. I got off on a tangent and I got here from, oh, it was a great problem that the tests take too long to run. That's way better than not having enough tests and just being afraid of putting stuff into production. Oh, well, this is a good problem to have. This is like when you have so much money that you can't stack it all in your house. This is a good problem to have. So having too many tests to run quickly, that's a good problem. And now what do we do about it? And what's been frustrating for me is that test run times have been creeping up and up and up and up and up for the last 20 years. And now it's common for me to talk to teams where they have a build pipeline and the build pipeline has lots of stages. And the more stages there are, the better people feel because now they're doing this and that and the other and blah, 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 blah. And all of those are involved in exactly these loops that we've been looking at. But nobody seems to want to do anything about it. And I, I feel a little like the the prophet who's in the wilderness and says, hey, the end of the world is coming. And everybody goes, hi. And that's, that's the only response. So one of the responses that people have made is to think about the throughput of uh, testing tools. So now we have, we had a thousand tests and they took a minute to run. Now we have 10,000 tests and now they take 10 minutes to run. So uh, with uh, we can parallelize running tests because your test should be isolated. Oh, that's another reference. Uh, I did a series of videos called the test desiderata. Desiderata is a Latin word meaning desirable properties. Um, and uh, we, we have all these tests. Now I've got 10 minutes worth of tests. I can run them in parallel because the tests are isolated from each other because tests should be isolated from each other. And now I can run all, all of my tests in five minutes instead of 10 minutes. Woo! It's all the tests. And uh, and I'm, I'm now I have 10 times as many tests, but it only takes five times as long. I've made big progress and all the test run work that I've seen has been about improving the throughput. Okay. So now, now we have, uh, uh, a hundred thousand tests and I can run them in just 20 minutes. Okay. And now I have a million tests and I can run them in just an hour. Well, you know, it's sublinear, that's good. But it does nothing to help the human side, which is the delay causing impatience. So I'm, I want people to stop worrying about throughput 
and start worrying about latency. That is, it's not how many tests can we run per unit time. It is the delay between me pushing the button, saying, okay, run the tests, and me getting an answer. Now, um, I have a specific metric in mind for this, which if, if you're working on your build pipeline, you can start measuring this today. Uh, most of the time, most of the tests will pass. And if you go look at your test runs and, and data from your test runs, I'll, I will make a prediction and I would even make you a cash money bet that the number of failures per test run is distributed on a power law. So most test runs have either one or zero failures. And half as many have two failures and half as many have four failures and half as many have eight failures and half as many have 16 and so on and so forth. And then every once in a while, all the tests fail because whatever, some common cause. So I think if you go and look, and it, by the way, feel free to contradict me with data. If you, if you just don't like this idea, then I don't wanna talk about it. But if you have data where you say, no, 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 always one test or, or zero tests fail, then I would be interesting, interested in seeing that data. So the latency I'm looking for is a very specific one. If a test is going to fail, how long before, what's the delay before I'm notified of that test failure? That's the metric. It's the um, uh, mean time to first failure. That's the metric that I really care about. If I'm going to have a problem, how quickly am I notified? Now, it turns out if you write a, a, a testing tool, a test runner, and you use mean time to first failure as the metric that you optimize for, there are some really simple tricks that you can use because the probability of a test failing is not evenly distributed. Most tests in your test suite will fail either zero or one time in their whole lifetime. So say you're using test-driven development, your test is going to fail once and then you make it pass and it's never going to fail again. And most tests, that's the truth. The number of failures per, uh, per test though is power law distributed. So almost all tests will fail once, half as many tests will fail twice, Half as many tests will fail four times. Half as many tests will fail eight times. And then you got to have one test that just breaks all the damn time. That's, that's I, again, if you go and do study your data and it contradicts me, feel free to tell me. What that means is I should be right, running the tests that fail all the time early in the sequence of running tests because it's more likely that one of those is going to fail than something that I wrote 15 years ago that failed once and has never, ever failed since then. So we can take the order of the tests that we, the order of the, of the tests that we run is critical to this a mean time to first failure. We can take the tests that are likely to fail and we can move them earlier in the sequence and improve this mean time to first failure, which is exactly this delay, which leads to impatience, which leads to horrible disaster. So that's one heuristic is frequently failing tests move to the front of the line. Uh, another heuristic is that tests that are brand new can move to the front of the line. Remember I said most tests fail once and only once ever. Well, if I just wrote this test, I should run it first because this is likely to be its one time. And now if I get a failure, I'm going to get it right away. 
another way of ordering the tests to improve mean time to first failure is uh, recency of the of failures. So it's not just say I had a flaky test. We fixed the flakiness. It failed a thousand times. We fixed the flakiness. Now it always passes. It turns out that the probability of a test failing is strongly correlated with the recency of its most recent failure. And intuitively, this makes sense to me. I haven't touched this code in a while. I go, I change something, a test fails. I try and fix it, it fails again. I try and fix it, okay, now it passes, good. That, it's still sensitive. It's still more likely to fail, you know, because now I, somebody else looks at the changes I made. They make changes in the same area. That test is likely to fail early. So just by sorting the tests by likelihood of failure, we can get dramatic improvements in mean time to first failure. Now, one of the implications of this is that the information value of the delay of running the tests degrades sharply. Mostly, if there's going to be a failure, it's going to happen in that first little slice of time because we carefully ordered the tests so that the high information value tests are packed early in the, in the test run. So if I have 10,000 tests, and I run all of the at-risk tests early, and the first couple of seconds go by and everything's passed, I haven't run, maybe I've only run 100 out of the 10,000 tests, but the information value of all the rest of the 9,900 tests is diminishingly small. I can move forward expecting that they're all going to pass because they passed last time and the time before that and the time before that and the time before that. And every once in a while, I have to run all the tests. Sure, because there's a non-zero chance that any test is going to fail. But most of the time, I can act like this delay has gone to one second or 10 seconds. But it's not the hour it would take to run all the tests. And that's that's a little tweak to the programming workflow. It's not expensive to implement. I, I implemented a tool called JUnit Max that I briefly tried to sell and then gave up on uh, that used these techniques. And uh, you know how you, you get syntax, notification of syntax errors as you type? You know, so uh, the, I forget uh, to balance my parentheses. And right then, I, I get a notification, and there's a little squiggly underline that says, oh, there's something wrong with this. The tests felt like that, where I didn't even think of running the tests as a separate part of my programming workflow. It was, I would just, I'd make some changes, and I'd press save, and the test would automatically run, and I'd get the results in a second, and usually it was okay. And as soon as it's okay, then, then it feels good and I'm ready to go uh, back to the next thing. Oh, I, I erased that. The, that anxiety loop. You know, I'd, I'd be like, oh, did I break something? No. Okay. Keep going. My brain's back to full functioning. I can continue working. And that feels fantastic. But, uh, and, and that's, from a human standpoint, that's what I care about. I want my experience of programming to feel joyous. I want to be engaged in what I'm doing. I don't want to be afraid of what I'm doing. I want to be engaged in it. I want my brain to open up to new opportunities, to new vistas, to stretch in ways that feel good. Like, oh, I've never tried this before. Let's try it and see what happens. As opposed to, I've never tried this before, so I better just not do anything. Ugh, I hate that. So there's a, a human side to it. I believe 
and this is uh, me kind of preaching a little bit, but I believe there are profound economic consequences to paying attention to the systemic cost of delay in programming. I, I don't have proof of it. I don't have a software company. But when I talk, what I reflect on my own practice, when I start getting annoyed at the delay from running the tests and I optimize it, I think I do better. I create more value. When I talk to teams and they have a, a build pipeline and it takes 40 minutes and we work on it and it takes 10 minutes now, I believe there are economic consequences for that. But like, yes, I need, to, at some point I need to justify what I'm doing economically. But also what I really care is about the human cost in lost potential of not caring about something as simple and easy to measure as the delay in getting feedback. Now, this is true of, of tests and the feedback you get from tests, but I believe it's also true of all the different feedback cycles that, that we operate that, that keep us on track, whether it's Pair programming is a delay of feedback from your fellow, from your colleagues. And eliminating that delay reduces impatience and reduces batch size, reduces the number of mistakes, and, and, and. You can have delays in getting feedback from real users. And uh, I'm, I'm managing a team now at, at Gusto and uh, the the most consequential suggestion I made was that we should give demos to our users every day. And the programmers said, no, I know I have some more problems to fix. I don't want to give a demo yet because I know there's still going to be problems. And so, and that led them to doing work on speculation that didn't really help. And that speculation fed into further delays and more impatience. And so now our goal is to have a demo that's perfectly smooth and it's never perfectly smooth. And it's fine because the software the users are currently using is awful. And our software, though incomplete, is exactly what they've asked us for. Not in a, you know, go away and give us a list of 500 features, but in a conversational way. Okay, what, what does it need to do next? Okay, is this good enough for you to file taxes next week? No? Okay, I got to fix this. That's the most important thing. Because that the, we've reduced that delay from months to weeks to days to sometimes hours, we're making better priority decisions. We have stronger relationships. We have more emotional energy and motivation to improve the system. Uh, we're more on top of our game. Like if you're making changes to some system and some person you don't know is going to use it six months from now, like, and I make, I cut a little shortcut. Nobody will really notice. Like, who cares? But if I'm changing a system that Frank is going to use this afternoon, and if it crashes, he doesn't get to go to his kid's birthday party, I'm not going to take shortcuts. I'm going to be on my game. And the more you're on your game, the better your game gets. That's a loop I am happy to run from now until I can't program one character anymore. I want to be in that situation. Yeah, the stakes are high, but the stakes were always high. Now I can feel it, and now I can do something about it in a way that I couldn't have before. And by the way, the delay for the individual often um, is uh, contradictory for delay for the whole system. like. If you want to execute all the tests, you probably want to start from the slowest one. So 
you don't have a situation when you um, executed all the fast ones, and then there is a single one going on and on and on, and you cannot really, and you don't know. So you, you to, in order to get the whole feedback fast, you need to start from the slowest test, and that brings an anxiety to developers. So uh, just like you described, you try to make developers happy. What do you think of the whole thing? Well, so test run times are also distributed on a power law. If, if you show me if you show me your ten slowest tests, I can predict very accurately how many tests you have. It's that it's it's the 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 distribution. I, for every set of tests that well, I've that, ever that looked depends, at. That depends. The, the tests uh, might have different uh, types of testing, like um, performance testing might be completely off the question, right? Nope, nope. No. This, is, this is where scale-free is so beautiful. If you plot test run times on a log-log scale, a histogram on a log-log scale, it makes a straight line. Just always. And, and and you can say yeah, but this is a special case, and da da da, and it's still going to fall right on the distribution. And and if it doesn't, please tell me. I keep trying to find uh, uh, contradictions to this, and I and I don't find them. But your 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 point is well taken. If you can, so this this was a big problem at Facebook because it was so performance sensitive. If you accidentally broke, had a performance regression, you could bring the whole site down. And so uh, uh, performance testing was brought into the inner loop of uh, uh, you'd submit a, uh, a PR and part of what happened in the build cycle is there would be a performance regression, automated performance regression test. And now not every organization it, it, are, are not not for every organization are, are uh, those kind of performance regressions that important. But if it is, yeah, you can you can bring that closer and closer to the inner loop. Now, I, me being uh, an idealist, I wonder. All right, uh, you know, let's say the performance test takes fifteen minutes to run. Could we run? Could we get a fairly predictive test that ran in a minute instead. Like where where is that trade-off? There's predictive the predictive nature of, of this performance test and then there's the delay. All right, so can we change the shape of these curves so that it's easier and easier or shorter and shorter to get some predictive power out of uh, out of our performance tests in a minute, in 10 seconds, in one second, in 100 milliseconds. Like why not? We, you know, it's just a trade-off curve. We don't know. Nice thing about trade-off curves: there's no right answer because you always yeah, have the depends, option of changing. I mean, you, if you, the if the test introduces a bug which manifests its, um, I don't know, out of memory kind of errors in a couple of weeks, you need those uh, couple of weeks to test to to, to make sure the code can sustain that. Absolutely. So uh, Facebook did a lot of Linux kernel development and their release cycle was months long and it had to be months long. Exactly. If you had some memory leak that, uh, you know, uh, with uh, that only was triggered by some race condition and that only happened in high load and blah, 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 blah. You could have a significant bug and not see it for months. So that's, Okay, fine. That's that's your cycle. You can still look at this trade-off and say, "All right, could I get a slightly less predictive test in way less time? Is that possible? Can I can I tilt the the curves? And maybe yes, and maybe no. Maybe yes, and it's too expensive, and you choose not to do it. But what drives me nuts is people picking one spot. If you look at all the dimensions along which tests can vary, people pick one spot in that search space and say, oh, that's it, that's what tests are. You know, you should write integration tests, but you shouldn't write unit tests. 
Are you kidding me? That I want I want to be aware of that whole space of all possible tests and choose what parts of that space I'm going to occupy. And it'll be different parts at different times. And that's that's just fine. But this idea that you can say, oh, no, unit testing is fine. You never have to t do anything else. No, no, that's absolutely not true. I, I think, Vladimir, that we're out of time for this presentation, but that we're going to have some q and I had enough coffee this morning. I'm ready to take your questions. And uh, we have a little bit of, uh, of uh, logistics to, to yeah, go exactly, through. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really time to move to the discussion zone. So everyone, please uh, follow the Zoom link you have uh, in the browser. Don't um, hesitate and don't um, forget to ask to leave your comments on the talk. Like, just to say what you liked the most, what you didn't like uh, during the talk. It would really help uh, Kent to make the talk better. So that's that's really great. Uh, just go to discussion zone and ask your questions. That's a nice opportunity. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you See so you. much. Thank you, Kent.